My name is Hillel Neuer and I'm the Executive Director of United Nations Watch. On behalf of our 25 NGO co-sponsors, it is my honour to open the 2022 edition of our annual World Assembly of Human Rights Dissidents, Pro-Democracy Activists, Former Political Prisoners and Family Members and Representatives of Current Political Prisoners. I want to begin by thanking our partners, a cross-regional coalition of human rights organizations for helping us to organize this summit and to unite courageous champions of human rights and democracy. I also want to thank our incredible Shayla Raka, Chloe Higgen, Eileen Ergil Amsalem, Dylan Rogers, and, I, and our entire team of staff and volunteers for their dedicated work and long hours over months to make this Geneva Summit a great success. We meet across the street from the United Nations Human Rights Council to shine a global spotlight on urgent situations of human rights and to place them on the international agenda. Now, all too often, sadly, the UN elevates and empowers the oppressors, for example, by electing them to human rights bodies. Well, here at the Geneva Summit, we choose to elevate and empower the oppressed, those who dare to speak out in the name of freedom and human dignity for their people. And I have to say that we meet today next to the Human Rights Council at a fascinating moment for only the second time in history, a member state of the UNHRC is likely to be removed tomorrow. The United States announced that working together with Ukraine and European states, they will move to suspend Russia from the Council. Yesterday, US Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield said the following, quote, Russia should not have a position of authority in a body whose purpose is to promote respect for human rights. Not only is this the height of hypocrisy, it is dangerous. Russia is using its membership on the Council as a platform for propaganda to suggest it has a legitimate concern for human rights. Russia's participation on the Council hurts its credibility, undermines the entire UN, and is just plain wrong. Wow. This is exactly what we have been saying all along when we first tried to stop Russia, China, and Cuba from getting elected in the first place in 2020 but we couldn't get any governments to say these words. And from day one of the invasion in February, we called on Russia to be expelled. Now, so we hope the resolution tomorrow passes with a large majority, and that's one more reason why the world needs to hear eyewitness testimony today from our speaker, Olga Ivazovska, a Ukrainian civil society leader who was forced to flee Kiev not long ago. But this should be a larger turning point. After Russia is removed, we urge the same to be done to other dictatorships on the Council. And after we hear from Joey Su on Hong Kong and from Tenzin Tsundu, a Tibetan refugee and activist, I am sure you will agree that China does not belong on a Human Rights Council. And after we hear from Hamlet Lavastida, an artist from Cuba and a political prisoner just released in September, I'm sure you'll agree that the Cuban dictatorship does not belong on a Human Rights Council. And after we hear from Miguel Otero of Venezuela, whose leading newspaper, El Nacional, was targeted by the Maduro regime, I believe you'll agree that this narco-criminal state does not belong on a Human Rights Council. And I urge everyone to sign the petition that we launched, headed by our board member, Ambassador Diego Aria, on our website, unwatch.org slash expel Maduro. 180,000 people have already signed. Now, what the U.S. Ambassador said about Russia applies perfectly to HRC members like Eritrea, which has slave labor, Libya, which tortures African migrants, Mauritania, which still has slavery, Pakistan, which hosts terrorists, Somalia, with female genital mutilation. These two must all be removed from the Human Rights Council. Indeed, regular people around the world ask, why does a Human Rights Council include so many non-democracies? Today, it's 68% of the Council are non-democracies. Defenders of the system have a ready reply. We need a big tent, they say, so that countries with poor records can engage, learn, and improve. Well, we've heard this numerous times from foreign ministers and top diplomats on the record from several EU states. And I don't want to mention names, but we've heard this from a Swedish-speaking country, a Dutch-speaking -speak country, and a Belgian-speaking country. Now, perhaps there is an argument that nations with spotty records but who actually wish to make progress can be embraced and given technical expertise, cooperation, for example, to train their judges and police. But does the United Nations 
have to keep electing the world's worst abusers, dictatorships whose only intent is to win a false badge of international legitimacy. So we ask all of those at the UN who propagate the big tent theory. Since Vladimir Putin's Russia was elected again and again to the Human Rights Council across the street over a decade, did he learn and improve? Or on the contrary, did Russia only assassinate more journalists, persecute more dissidents, and launch more deadly military invasions than ever before? Since China was elected repeatedly to the Human Rights Council, did the communist rulers of Beijing learn and improve? Or did they only crush more dissidents like Liu Xiaobo than ever before? And I want to know, since Venezuela was elected again and again to this council, did Chavez and Maduro learn and improve? Or on the contrary, did they only arrest, persecute, and jail more opposition leaders like Mayor Antonio Ledesma of Caracas? No, my friends, the big tent theory is a big lie. And so we hope that the removal of Russia tomorrow from the Human Rights Council will be a moment to affirm truth and moral clarity. Friends, the fact that we are meeting here today, hundreds of people together in one room with speakers flying in from able, able to travel here, from Los Angeles to Dharamsala, from London to Zimbabwe, is something we cannot take for granted. After two very difficult years of the COVID-19 pandemic, I want to say how truly grateful we are to be able to meet in person. During these two years, many of us had to spend time in some form of social isolation due to quarantine or lockdowns, and we learned how painful that can be. That experience might help us to appreciate the infinitely greater suffering of innocent men and women who are severely and arbitrarily denied their freedom. And we're going to hear compelling testimony today from former political prisoners. We'll hear from Pham Min Wong, a scholar and former political prisoner from Vietnam, and from Hopewell Shinono, a journalist from Zimbabwe and recent political prisoner. And Timothy Cho, who was imprisoned and tortured in North Korea, managed to escape and is today a human rights activist. And we'll hear about current political prisoners. While Russia sits across the street as a member of the Human Rights Council, we'll hear shortly about Alexei Navalny, the jailed Russian opposition leader from his chief of staff, Leonid Volkov. And while China sits across the street as a member of the council, we'll hear from Sophie Lu about her husband, the human rights lawyer, Ding Jaxi, a political prisoner in China. And we'll hear from Ushan Abbas, about the plight of the Uyghurs, including her sister, Dr. Gulshan Abbas, another political prisoner in China. And while the Iranian regime sits on the UN Commission on the Status of Women, which they just joined a week ago, we'll hear from Mariam Klarin, daughter of Nahi Tajavi, a women's rights activist imprisoned in Iran. And Belarus also sits on that commission, but we'll hear from Tatiana Khomic about her sister, Maria Kalasnikava, a woman human rights defender imprisoned in Belarus. Nicaragua sits on the UN Committee that oversees human rights NGOs in New York. But we'll hear from Berta Valle about her husband, Felix Maradiaga, a speaker here at this summit in 2019, who was thrown into prison for daring to run for president against the dictator Daniel Ortega. Saudi Arabia in Paris sits on the UNESCO Human Rights Committee. But we'll hear from Arij Al-Sadan about her brother, Saudi political prisoner Abdurrahman Al-Sadan, who has been punished for tweeting for his peaceful use of social media to call out Saudi human rights abuses. And we will hear from Bobby Wine, Ugandan opposition leader, <clears throat> 2021 presidential candidate. Last but not least, we'll present our Women's Rights Award to Zarifa Ghaffari, youngest mayor in Afghanistan, survivor of several assassination attempts. And our Courage Award will be presented to Ennis Cantor, freedom NBA basketball, player and human rights activist. So friends, it's a powerful program with inspiring people to inform us about vital issues going on today in the world. Your participation today matters. We need you to amplify the voices of our human rights heroes that you will hear. Please share our Geneva Summit posts, which you can find on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Make sure to add your own voice together with the hashtag Geneva Summit 2022. Follow our remarkable speakers on their own accounts and share their testimonies. It is not your duty 
to finish the work of perfecting the world, but everyone is obliged to do their part. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.